Today we continue on in a sermon series uh, dealing with God's questions. And what we've been doing is we've been kind of going through and, and studying in depth a little bit uh, some of the places found in the Bible where God pauses and asks a question. Because every time that God asks a question, that should really draw our attention to that question. Because you understand, don't you, God doesn't need to ask questions. He knows everything there is to know. And yet we find over and over in Scripture God asking questions. And he does so for a very good reason. Today, we, as we study um, uh, the life of, of one of God's most powerful vessels, we're studying the life of Elijah. And what we're going to see here is in 1 Kings chapter 19 that he is um, asking him a very poignant question, a very direct question. And um, it, it's very interesting to me that that as he's alone with Elijah, that this question even comes about. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But to help you kind of understand a little bit of just how important Elijah is, um, hopefully you understand a little bit how important Elijah is, but Elijah was, was very well respected and very well admired and well loved by the, uh, the Jews of that day. Um, he was kind of like their go-to hero. I would even dare suggest that Elijah was more revered than even Moses was. And we'll explain why in just a little bit. But it's not surprising that we find Elijah's name mentioned 68 times in the Old Testament. We would expect that. We would expect that Elijah's an Old Testament kind of a guy. We would expect that his name would be used a lot in the Old Testament. But what is surprising is that Elijah's name is used 30 times in the New Testament. That's surprising to me. But that just goes to show how well-liked he was. Well, why was he so well-liked? Why was he so well-respected by Jews? Well, um, to understand the answer to that question, you have to look back into 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, you can, if you've been in church a long time or any length of time as a kid, you've probably heard the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And uh, just how incredible of an encounter that was as, as he was toe-to-toe with these, with these uh, 800 false prophets of God and specifically the 450 prophets of Baal. He was toe-to-toe and he was challenging them and they, they built these two altars, remember? And he said to those guys, hey, you guys built an altar and I'll build an al- altar and, and we'll put meat on it and we won't light it. What we're going to do is we're each going to call to our God. You guys pray out and call out to Baal, your God, I'm going to call out to my God, Jehovah God, and we'll see which God answers by fire. And um, anyway, um, I, I could probably just spend some time telling you the story, but I think they've got the video queued up, and uh, we're just going to spend some time letting you see and hear the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. King Ahab and his evil queen Jezebel have led Israel astray by worshipping other gods. The land is gripped by a terrible drought. While the prophets of God have been under siege by Jezebel's orders to kill them, the worship of Baal has flourished. Elijah, God's prophet, demands to see Ahab. Ahab went to meet Elijah, and when he saw him, Ahab shouted, There you are, the biggest troublemaker in Israel! Elijah answered, You're the troublemaker, not me. You and your family have disobeyed the Lord's commands by worshipping Baal. Call together everyone from Israel and have them meet me on Mount Carmel. Be sure to bring along the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Ahab got everyone together. Then they went to meet Elijah on Mount Carmel. Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you try to have things both ways? If the Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. The people did not say a word. Then Elijah continued, I am the Lord's only prophet, but Baal has 450 prophets. Bring us two bulls. Baal's prophets can take one of them, kill it, and cut it into pieces. Then they can put the meat on the wood without lighting the fire. I will do the same thing with the other bull, and I won't light a fire under it either. The prophets of Baal will pray to their God, and I will pray to the Lord. The one who answers by starting the fire is God. That's a good idea, everyone agreed. 
Elijah said to Baal's prophets, there are more of you, so you go first. Pick out a bull and get it ready, but don't light the fire. Then pray to your God. They chose their bull. Then they got it ready and prayed to Baal all morning, asking him to start the fire. They danced around the altar and shouted, answer us, Baal! But there was no answer. At noon, Elijah began making fun of them. Pray louder, he said. Baal must be a god. Maybe he's daydreaming or, or using the toilet or, or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep and you have to wake him up. The prophets kept shouting louder and louder and they cut themselves with swords and knives until they were bleeding. This was the way they worshiped and they kept it up all afternoon. But there was no answer of any kind. Elijah told everyone to gather around him while he repaired the Lord's altar. Then he used 12 stones to build an altar in honor of the Lord. Each stone stood for one of the tribes of Israel, which was the name the Lord had given to their ancestor Jacob. Elijah dug a ditch around the altar, large enough to hold about 13 quarts. He placed the wood on the altar. Then they cut the bull into pieces and laid the meat on the wood. He told the people, fill four large jars with water and pour it over the meat and the wood. After they did this, he told them to do it two more times. They did exactly as he said, until finally the water ran down the altar and filled the ditch. When it was time for the evening sacrifice, Elijah prayed, Our Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. Now prove that you are the God of this nation and that I, your servant, have done this at your command. Please answer me so that these people will know that you are the Lord God and that you will turn their hearts back to you. The Lord immediately sent fire and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, and the stones. It scorched the ground everywhere around the altar and dried up every drop of water in the ditch. When the crowd saw what had happened, they all bowed down and shouted, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Just then Elijah said, grab the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them get away. So the people captured the prophets and took them to the Kishon River, where Elijah killed every one of them. Okay, so that was 1 Kings chapter 18. We're in 1 Kings chapter 19. And that helps you kind of understand a little bit why Elijah was so revered by the Jews of his day. As a matter of fact, Elijah was so well respected and so well revered that by the time Jesus comes and he begins his ministry and he's well into his ministry, there were even like these murmurs going around, these rumors going around that Jesus was Elijah. And uh, that just shows you a little bit about, about how well respected and, and well loved he was. I mean, how often times, I can guarantee you, um, there's never ever come a day, there's never ever been a day where Jesus has been mistaken uh, for Mark Nichols, okay? Um, and, and to see that, that Jesus was mistaken for Elijah, that kind of gives you a little inkling here that, that just how well loved Elijah was. Well, that was chapter 18 of 1 Kings. Our text is chapter 19. And what we're going to see is a vast difference between the two character qualities of Elijah. In just a short period of time, we had this mountaintop experience that Elijah was experiencing. And now things are very, very much different in chapter 19. So follow along with me this morning as I read from our text. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Now King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah has do had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. What she was doing was she was threatening his life, saying, I'm going to, to do to you just like you did to all the prophets. Verse 3, And Elijah was afraid and arose and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now before I read verse 4, I want, to th I want you to think about verse 4, and I want you to think about how you would describe Elijah, okay? 
So let me read it, and then you think about how you would describe Elijah's uh, uh, character here in verse 4. Let me read it. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and he sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not any better than my father's. How would you describe his character in this moment? How would you describe his countenance? Take some time, write some words that would describe Elijah in this moment. And I want you to take time to do that because it's very important. Very important. How would you describe Elijah in verse 4? Here are some words that came to my mind as I was studying this past week. Discouraged. Defeated. Depressed, depleted, despair. If you've never been in the place that Elijah is at at this point in his life, then you won't get it, you won't understand. You can't relate to what Elijah is experiencing. I'll be honest with you. I was looking back through past sermon notes. The last time I preached on Elijah and the prophets of Baal, it was in uh, 2009. I didn't get it. I didn't understand chapter 19. I didn't understand why he came to this place and why he was so discouraged and despair. I didn't understand it. I'm sad to say now, I know exactly what he's feeling. And if you have been there, if you've been in this place where Elijah has been, if it's ever happened in your life, then you totally understand Elijah's next course of action. Look at verse 5. He lay down and he slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise and eat. Then Elijah looked, and behold, there was at his head bread, a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, and he ate, and he drank. And he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights until he came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And that's the question I want us to focus on this morning. As God gets this prophet, this man of God, this mouthpiece of God alone in a cave, he brings to his mind this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Let's see how well we remember. Uh, wh why does God ask questions? Do you remember? We, we addressed this the very first two sermons we've been in this series. Why does God ask questions? If he already knows the answer to everything, why does God ask questions? Here's why. For our benefit. When he asks you a question, he's doing so for your benefit, to help maybe open your eyes to the truth, to help you reflect, to help you come to terms with reality. And so with that in mind, as God is asking this question of Elijah, he's doing it for the benefit of Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here living in this cave the way that you are? Is this what I've called you to? You see, Elijah needs to wake up to the reality and realize just how it is he came to this place in his life. Why is it that you're feeling depressed, defeated, de diminished, depleted? Why is it that you're feeling in despair at this moment? I mean, Elijah went from boldly challenging false prophets and now he's living like a, recl a recluse in a cave? How did you get here, Elijah? What happened in your life to lead you to this point? Because Elijah was not in a good place. I believe that there are some who can totally relate to the question that God is asking. What are you doing here? What has happened in your life to get you to where you're at? And maybe you're here this morning and you're here reluctantly. And maybe the question that God would have for you, what has happened in your life to turn you off to Christianity? To, to, to make you reject God's Son? To make you just kind of disgusted with church and the Bible. What has happened to you in your life? And maybe for others, maybe something more tragic has happened. And, and, but God would still ask you, what is it? I care about what has happened to you in your life. Maybe somebody you love has died. 
and you're feeling depressed, you're feeling like you can't move on, you feel like you just, you, you, there's no hope. You're in despair. And so God is asking very lovingly to you this morning, um, what are you doing here? How did Elijah get to this place in life? How did things flip so quickly? One moment he was on top of the world, literally having a mountaintop experience, seeing God's glory come down from heaven in fire. And now he's holed up in a cave. What happened? Well, what I want us to see is I want us to see in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, I believe there's something we can point to to say, this is what has happened. And it begins with unexpected opposition. You see, it's not just opposition. Elijah was used to opposition. He'd been dealing with opposition most of his ministry. All throughout 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah was going toe-to-toe with the king, King Ahab. But, but now it seems here in chapter 19 that Elijah seems to kind of be taken back a bit when his opposition comes from a source that maybe he wasn't expecting to have to deal with, the queen, Queen Jezebel. I want to read once again verses 1 through 3 of 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and he came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. To give you a little bit of an idea of how far he ran... Um, Mount Carmel was, was, part, it was uh, in the northern kingdom, Israel, and as soon as this happens, he flees. Okay? He runs to the southern kingdom in Judah, to Beersheba, where he leaves his servant behind. Why would he do that? Because he's facing this opposition that he didn't see coming. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, you understand that you're going to face opposition. I hope you understand that. That at some point in your life, if you're a committed follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to bump into some opposition. I hope you understand that. Uh, I grew up as a preacher uh, in, in a preacher's home. Um, I understand very well that opposition comes. That, that doesn't bother me. Opposition comes with the territory of leadership. Opposition comes with the territory of following Jesus. I mean, it was Jesus himself who said, you will be hated because of me. Um, and so we expect to face opposition. But the problem comes when the opposition that we're facing comes from an area that we didn't expect it to come from. Look back to verse 3 at this unexpected opposition. And look at what it has done to Elijah. Just go through verse 3 and underline some of the verbs you read in verse 3. Uh, we find words like afraid, arose, ran, left. We see these verbs of, of retreat rather than pushing forward to do what God has called him to do. You see, it's not just opposition. Elijah handled opposition well, but what's different? It's the opposition that comes from unexpected places. Opposition from Queen Jezebel. And so I want to ask you this morning, what is your Jezebel? Maybe you're feeling a little bit like you're defeated in life. And maybe it's because you've experienced opposition in your life from unexpected places. And so I ask you, what is your Jezebel? Maybe it's something that you never saw coming. You never dreamed that it would happen. But sure enough, it's happening. It's here. And it's menacing. It's like a sucker punch that you just were not prepared for. And maybe it was someone who used to be on your side. But not now. Something is switched. Something is changed. And now they're standing in strong opposition to you. And it's this opposition that is causing you to feel very much like Elijah felt. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a neighbor. A friend. Or worse yet, a spouse. But life has changed for you and now you're facing opposition from them. And it was totally unexpected. Things were going so well, but then it seems like at the drop of a hat, now they're not. But I also want you to notice that I said, what is your Jezebel and not who? While it is quite possible your Jezebel might be a person, it's also possible that it might be a circumstance. It, it might be a situation you find yourself in. And whatever it is, it is popped up 
And it's standing in strong opposition to you. For many, their Jezebel is cancer. You never in a million years thought this terrible disease would visit you or your loved ones. And the doctor's diagnosis is so troubling to you that it has left you feeling defeated, depressed, discouraged. For others, maybe Jezebel is a looming lawsuit, or maybe dealing with child custody, or a pending divorce, or a rebellious child that, you are at wits, that you're at your wit's end with how to corral their heart and bring them back to God. Regardless of what your Jezebel is, you need to understand that defeat, depression, despair, it happens to all of us from time to time. James chapter 1, verse 15 reminds us that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And so if Elijah is feeling this way, what's to keep you from assuming that it won't happen to you? Unexpected opposition. And the problem with unexpected opposition is that it's dangerous. I want to talk to you now about the dangers of the opposition you may be facing. Because the biggest danger of opposition isn't somebody disagreeing with you. That's not opposition, okay? It's not simply disagreement. Opposition is someone who is against you in every facet of life. They not only want to uh, not agree with you, but they don't even like you. And there's nothing that you can do in their eyes to change their mind about you. They want to see you fail. They're going to squelch everything that you try to accomplish. And that kind of opposition is dangerous. That kind of opposition is exactly what kind of opposition Jezebel was facing, or uh, Jezebel was giving to Elijah. Verse 2 says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life like one of those that you, that you killed by tomorrow about this time. That's a threat. And the reason that this kind of opposition is so dangerous is because it interferes with God's calling in your life. And so whatever your Jezebel is, however you've identified it, if it's causing you to feel depressed and defeated and in despair, that's dangerous. Because it's going to interfere with God's calling in your life. And yes, God has called you. Look at Elijah. This mouthpiece for the Lord was now shockingly silent. Hiding in a cave. That was interfering with his calling from God. Has your calling ever been threatened by opposition? Chuck Swindoll tells of a time in his first ministry where he was constantly at odd with a man who was in leadership at his church. Listen to Charles Swindoll's words as he relates the story. He says, One snowy morning, this particular man stopped by my study. He pulled back his coat and revealed a gun, and he said, I thought you should know something. I carry a gun with me. I keep it loaded. I just thought you should know that. And then he said, don't you ever cross me. And then he left. That kind of opposition breeds discouragement, breeds distraction, breeds despair. In those moments where you are facing strong opposition, allow me to remind you of something that I from time to time need to be reminded of as well. What you have is not a job. It's a calling. And as long as God is calling, we need to answer the call. And so in those moments where you face strong opposition, remember, God is in control. God is with you. I want to encourage you this morning by continuing on in our text in verses 5 through 21 because first we deal with unexpected opposition, but then comes the good news. All in favor of some good news this morning? We've all expected opposition, right? But here's the good news. Unexpected encouragement. That's the good news. And I love the way that, you, that God comes alongside Elijah. There's no scolding on God's part. There's no condemnation. There's no, well, it's your own fault for being in this mess. 
And I think one thing that we learn from this story of Elijah is how do you help encourage somebody? How do you help somebody who's feeling defeated or depressed or uh, in despair? And the answer is you encourage them. You lift them up. And that's God. Instead of doing the things that we might be tempted to do, to, to do or say to Elijah, God steps in and he encourages Elijah. And I want to show you four ways in the scriptures that God encouraged Elijah when he needed it the most. Here's the first way that God encouraged Elijah. God provided physical strength for him. The first thing that Elijah does after he stops running away from Jezebel is found in verse 5. And I want to point it out to you this morning. It reads, uh, He laid down and he slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise, eat. And then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones. A jar of water was there as well. And so he ate and he drank and he laid down again. Isn't that amazing? God, in his providential wisdom, brings Elijah to a place where there is a juniper tree. In this wilderness, in this barren land, God, in his providential care, leads Elijah to come to this place where there's this juniper tree. And that tree was exactly what Elijah needed in that moment. It was a place where Elijah could rest, relax, refresh, get his mind off of the stress and the worries. And it's in that place that Elijah sleeps. Have you ever wondered what a juniper tree looks like? It's a gnarly tree that is, that is used to growing in climates that are very harsh. And uh, such is the wilderness that Elijah had found himself in. And it's in this place, underneath that tree, that Elijah sleeps. And sometimes the best thing that you can do is rest. And even moving beyond rest, what else does God use to encourage Elijah? Food. And maybe it is true. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. The way to encourage a man is through food. And that's certainly what is happening here. And what surprises me about verse 5 is that Elijah doesn't seem surprised or shocked or even impressed that an angel is here with food for him. <laughs> you read it. It says, he wakes up, he sees the food, he's like, okay, I'll eat it. And then what's he do? I'll go back to sleep. Doesn't seem shocked or impressed that he just had breakfast with an angel. That's pretty amazing. So after he does this a couple more times, after he gets more sleep and more food into him, Elijah then takes off on a journey, a 200-mile straight south journey into the land of Midian to Mount Horeb, known as the Mountain of God also known as Mount Sinai. It's the same mountain where Moses received his calling from the Lord. And there Elijah finds a cave on the side of this mountain and he takes refuge once again. And in that cave, God and Elijah have a conversation. And God gently asks him a question in verse 9. What are you doing? How'd you get here, Elijah? And that brings us to the second way that Elijah is encouraged by God. And that is... God listens. God listens. Verse 10 contains Elijah's frustrations, his disappointments, his heartaches. And the amazing thing is, God spends time listening to him. Verse 10, Elijah said, I've been very zealous for you, Lord. But the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altar, and they've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away as well. Isn't it great that God listens to us? So why is it that we oftentimes voice our frustrations and disappointments to people rather than to God? Can people fix our frustrations? Probably not. A lot of times, it ends up being a lot worse. Because if you're discouraged, if you're facing opposition to your calling, and, and you're voicing this frustration to whoever might be listening, a lot of times they're kind of like a fan, fanning the flame that's burning within you. They're like, yeah, I agree. You should be upset. You should be mad. What they're doing is they're ministering to your flesh. They're not a calming, soothing uh, voice in your life. And so when you have disappointments and you have discouragements and you have heartaches, 
Take them to God. He listens. One more way that God encouraged Elijah, and it's pretty neat here, and I didn't know how else to word it than just simply say, God shows up. He just flat out shows up. And you'll know what I mean by that here in verses 11 and 12 because Elijah gets a little glimpse of God's power and his majesty. He just simply shows up. It reads, So God said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing. Man, I love these two verses that are recorded in Elijah's history. What Elijah needed was a fresh awareness of God. He needed God to show up, and God shows up. And his glory is on display. And I have no doubt that Elijah viewed God differently from that day on. I have no doubt that there are many of us in this room who need to be renewed, who need to have a right perspective of God once again. Our wonder and our awe is a little dingy. It's a little dull. Maybe we've forgotten. It needs to be reawakened. It needs to be revitalized. We need God to show up. And what I find interesting in Elijah's case is that God showed up, not in the wind, not in the earthquake or the fire, but the gentle whisper. I love what one commentary has said. To look for God only in something big may be to miss him because he's often found gently whispering in the quietness of a humbled heart. Are you listening for God? Take a step back from the noise and the activity of a busy life. Sit down alone and humbly listen and quietly wait for his guidance. It may come when you least expect it. And the final way, and I think the the neatest way, the most practical way that God encouraged Elijah was through this fourth thing, through a friend. You see, God provided somebody who would help him shoulder the load for Elijah. He was feeling alone. He was feeling like it was all him, that there was nobody else around him. So what does God do? He introduces him to a man that we know by the name of Elisha. And God tells Elijah where to find Elisha, and that Elijah was to anoint Elisha with oil. But what I love the best about chapter 19 is the very, very last sentence. The very, very last sentence. Look at it for yourself. It reads, Then Elisha arose and he followed Elijah and ministered to him. In your moment of discouragement, in your moment of despair or defeat, has God provided a friend who has come into your life and ministered to you? If so, then you understand what a blessing that is. What an encouragement. I want to ask you right now if you can think of five friends that God has brought into your life to help you when you've needed it the most, to encourage you, to lift you up when you're feeling pretty down. Elisha ministered to Elijah. Thank God for godly friends that he brings into our lives to encourage us. I want to conclude this morning by simply telling you that maybe you came here this morning and and you've been suffering through some very unexpected opposition, and I don't know your story. I don't know what it is. But I want to encourage you to say this, that God will provide for you just at the right time some unexpected encouragement. That's how God operates. And when he does, be sure to turn and thank him for what he's done. God will bring it. He's faithful. He's true. I also find it interesting that here Elijah was hiding into a cave, into into the side of a mountain. And time and time again, we're told that God is our rock, our refuge. We're to hide in him. He is our shield. He is our portion. 
He is our provision. 